Uh, I just want to give you a little context for what you'll be seeing tonight. Uh, from 2014 to 2017, I was program director at Chicago Filmmakers. Uh, that's an organization, a film co-op in Chicago that's been around for like 40 some odd years. And in the back room, there were just pile, we had our own distribution project. We had 16 and 35 millimeter films that we distributed. But then there were also just piles and piles of mystery films that weren't cataloged. Nobody really knew what they were. So I just love watching anything that I can get my hands on. So I just started watching them all. And there were some really great films in there. Uh, most of which, most of the titles had on their can, um, Center Cinema Co-op and uh, address on Lake Street in Chicago. And I couldn't really find much information about the Center Cinema Co-op. Uh, there's a legendary filmmaker in town named Tom Palazzolo. So people are like, oh, that's Tom was involved with that. Or Barbara Sherris, who now is involved with uh, Gene Siskel Film Center. She used to run that. Uh, but there wasn't a ton of information. So um, at the time in 2015, I made a screening uh, of the, the materials in the back room that included Center Cinema Co-op stuff and also uh, included some other materials, student work, just other stuff that was found back there. And at the time, that program was much more like lasciviously titled. I called it Hippies Doing Things Nude. It focused a lot more on like the, the dancing, the uh, colorful psychedelic uh, loops, one of which you'll see uh, during the screening tonight. Uh, but that one was just much more of a mixed bag. Um, and I didn't think much of it. At the time, I tried to find a lot of the filmmakers represented, but uh, beyond just mentions in old student newspapers from the 60s and 70s, there really was no evidence of these films, or at least none that I could find. Um, at the time, I uh, 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 sent a friend request to Tom Baum on Facebook um, that went unanswered. He probably doesn't use it very often. Um, but uh, it went unanswered, and I didn't think anything of it until, weirdly enough, last year, I wanted to block somebody on Facebook. So I went back and saw Tom's name listed there amongst my friend requests. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to look for that guy again. So I looked for him. He had just started uh, his own personal website, and I sent him a message and said, are you the Tom Baum that made uh, Catman's Primal Scene? And uh, it, very unexpectedly, he was, he was delighted to hear from me and uh, delighted that somebody had seen the film in the past 30, 35 years. Uh, so due to that connection, um, uh, during that screening, uh, you can uh, look it up on the Chicago Tribune website. Uh, Nina um, Metz wrote up that screening and everybody sung the praises of the films of Thomas Baum and uh, his partner at the time, Dennis Lowe. Uh, their three films, which will be the first three films you'll see tonight, served as sort of like the heart of that screening. Um, and so I decided to do another screening and just focus on the Center Cinema Co-op stuff. Uh, so that's what you'll be seeing tonight. Um, the films left behind from the Center Cinema Co-op when it closed down in 1978. Uh, the the co-op started in 1968. Uh, there was a sort of legendary movie theater called the Aardvark Theater that existed out of the Second City space. Uh, Bernie Salins had a lot to do with the creation of both the Aardvark and the Second City. Obviously, he's the legendary creator of Second City. Um, but um, Aardvark also did film distribution. Uh, but they weren't paying their bills. Um, in Scott McDonald's book on Canyon Cinema, you can read this little uh, aside that the, somebody wrote about the aardvark and like, uh, they didn't pay, um, I forget which filmmaker it was. They, they awarded a cash prize at a festival. They didn't pay, they, weren't, they didn't have their finances in order, so they were just kind of just sloppy. Uh, and they dissolved, but a group of local Chicago filmmakers, including, uh, let me, make sure I get all the names correct. Uh, well, Tom Palazzolo was one of them. And, hmm, uh, Ron Namath. And, hmm, hey guys, I did this and did this and now my notes are gone. Anyway, Ron Namath, uh, Tom Palazzolo, Jeff Begun, and Larry Janiak uh, were the founders of it in 1968. And the co-op ran from 68 to 78. They had a lot more success than the Aardvark folks did. Um, they connected with the Illinois Arts Council and uh, the local uh, regional speakers bureaus and they sent filmmakers out to schools and everything to show programs of this work and for them to talk. 
Um, yeah, and they had a decent amount of success for a 10-year run. They were originally housed in Columbia College, but then they switched over to being housed at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And at that time, Barbara Sherris uh, was running it, and due to the connections of the Art Institute, uh, the co-op had a large part in uh, 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 the creation of the Gene Siskel Film Center, which now exists in Chicago. So the Center Cinema Co-op has this weird history of being largely forgotten, but also a weird connective tissue in a lot of ways between all these major Chicago film uh, institutions like uh, the Aardvark and tangentially Second City and then the Gene Siskel Film Center. And everyone who started a major organization or did something important in Chicago film were in some way related to the Center Cinema Co-op if they were around at the time. Uh, so what you're going to be seeing is films uh, that were, oh, final element of it. In 1978, when the Center Cinema Co-op dissolved, they tried to find all the filmmakers, most of which they returned to the filmmakers uh, to which they belonged. But in the co-op records, which are at the Chicago History Museum, there's this list of like 30 filmmakers where they sent out a, a, a massive mailing to all their um, members and said, if you know where these filmmakers are, please tell us we need to return their films to them. Tom and Dennis were among them, and including all the other filmmakers at the time. Um, they just didn't have a current address of them in 1978, so they didn't know where to send these films to. Uh, so um, uh, that's the only reason they end up in Chicago Filmmakers. So as a result, a lot of these are orphan films, uh, just films with no home. Thankfully, I found Tom Baum. He uh, uh, was uh, uh, a little hard to find, but not that hard to find. Other filmmakers have been, um, I've located along the way that you'll be seeing tonight. Uh, Stephen Bezark, um, he recently passed away. He taught documentary film in Chicago for a long time. I found his son, so thankfully I'll be able to return those films uh, to Stephen. Stephen already has a place where his father's papers and films are donated, so that'll be rejoining his archive. Um, and uh, Richard Greenberg, uh, I believe his son Luke might be here, um, I'm not sure, but uh, Richard Greenberg I was able to find. Richard Greenberg was a title designer and credits designer in Hollywood for um, a good long time, like a major credits and title designer in the 80s and 90s, did Superman and a lot of uh, other uh, major uh, uh, credit and title designing jobs. And I was able to find his son, and hopefully I'll be able to return that film to him. Um, so uh, one goal is get those films out here again and let people see them, but also um, you know get their names out there and hopefully be able to find them and get their films returned to them after 40 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, get them into archives too, because a lot of these films, they're the only copies of them that exist, uh, probably. So what you're going to be seeing tonight is three films from Bauman Lowe. Um, and uh, they definitely served as the heart of the earlier screening. They're definitely uh, some of the standouts from everything that was left behind by uh, um, Center Cinema Co-op. I'm a big fan of them. And Thomas Baum is here, uh, as well as his wife Carol Baum, and we'll have Tom come up after their first three films. Uh, so we'll show their films, then Tom and I will chat for a little bit, and then you'll see the rest of the films. Um, the rest of the films, I already mentioned Stephen Bezark and Richard Greenberg, uh, Lawrence Lewis with the film The Match Seller. Uh, the only information I can find on that one, oddly enough, is uh, from the Los Angeles Film Forum website because they did a survey of called alternative projections of films that were made in the Los Angeles, experimental films, post-war experimental films made in the Los Angeles era area. And they have record of it, but they don't have any record of where Lawrence is or where this film is, and I can't find it for all my searching. Uh, Maurice Amar, Ragadoll, that's one of those flashy, nudie dance films that are a lot of fun. Um, he made another film that we have in the collection called The Wilton Youth Project. That's this very sincere, very long film made with um, the youth of Wilton, Connecticut. Uh, but Ragadoll is definitely, I wanted to include some elements of the sort of um, flashy, hippie, go-go, nudie reels, of which, honestly, there was a large chunk of those left behind with the Center <laughs> Cinema Co-op, too. Uh, and then Gerald Muller's Bath, uh, a film uh, with a lot of nudity, but in a more artful way, uh, sort of a minimalist black and white portrait of a woman. Um, and then H.J. Roman, he made another nudie, you're not going to be seeing his nudie reel tonight, but his uh, reel is called 
Oh, it's like it had an awful title, like Spectacular Woman or something. It was really bad. Uh, but his movie uh, is another. Um, weirdly, Marisa Mar and H. J. Roman both made sincere movies with youth, like youth art projects, and then also some flashy, crazy, dancing nudie reels. So you're going to be seeing uh, from H.J. Roman the sincere work that he made with the youth of this um, like uh, seaside art community and the pushback they got from the local uh, uh, conservative community about uh, having this coffee shop for the, for the dirty, smelly kids to play guitar and hang out. Uh, so yeah, that's what you'll be seeing. Uh, again, first... Bauman Low, then we'll come up here and talk a little bit about those films and then uh, we'll see the rest. Thank you so much to Adam and Madison for having me and showing these films. And uh, thank you guys for coming. Um, so yeah, I, I, you, do you want to tell a little bit about the history of these films? The history, well, uh, Dennis Lowe and I were worked at, in the NBC advertising department. He was an art director, I was a fledgling copywriter. And Dennis uh, introduced me to he was my mentor. He introduced me to, to movies via the Andrew Saris article in Film Culture magazine, which became Saris's The American Cinema. I didn't know what a shot was. Uh, I was a movie lover along with my wife. Uh, we were already married. Uh, we appear in The Catman. Um, and this was all, you know, like the mid-60s. Uh, and uh, we just started, he had a Bolio 16 millimeter. Um, we had no editing machine. All, everything you saw was edited on a synchronizer. We had no moviola. We had to, you know, edit it on the synchronizer and then run it through a projector. Um, the middle film was actually purchased by the USIA for a, you know, sizable amount of money. They, I don't know why. Uh, we had to hire we had to hire a lawyer so we wouldn't get sued because all that stuff was NBC promotional footage. The first film. <laughs> Was made. It's a little embarrassing to remember this, but um, they're all, I think they're all well cut. Um, the um, I just saw a routine that guy Paul Fleischer, who used to ride around New York on a unicycle, playing a saxophone. He was the brother of my. I went to medical school for about a year and a half. He was the brother of my cadaver partner, and he had this routine where he, you know, put um, coat hangers up his sleeves and dance with a cane to me in my shadow and I don't know somehow that struck us as an idea to make a movie around it and we shot it in my father's medical office with Betty Aberlin this was be I don't know if uh, she was in um, you know Mr. Rogers neighborhood this was like three years before uh, Mr. Rogers neighborhood sorry she was just a friend of my cadaver partner she um, she agreed to do it she was a you know working actress in New York um, I don't. I think she probably would disown this movie. Um, I'm not sure. I don't myself. But the um, uh, and then the, the middle film was. I, th I guess I think it showed it at, uh, at Cheetah, which was a, a new disc attack, and we just went in there and we shot the footage, and then we cut it together with you know as, as you saw. The third one was uh, Al Katz uh, called himself the Cat Man. He used to do this routine at parties. That was at an actual party that he was at, and then about his uh, witnessing his parents in the act of love for the first time. Uh, Al, unfortunately, ended up being institutionalized. Um, the last I heard from him, he called me up on the phone. He wondered whether his Hollywood career was going to launch as a basis of this movie. And I remember he said, um, uh, Baum, uh, you don't think I'm Jesus, do you? And I said, no. And, and, and he, was, he had uh, his problems. And uh, I don't know where he is today. I haven't uh, been in touch with, with really any of these people. And only recently, thanks to Josh, uh, reconnected with Dennis Lowe, um, who was a you know genius photographer, and he, he you know he he introduced me and, and my wife to uh, you know the sort of the Ashcan school of photography, uh, Bruce Davison and uh, I guess Robert Frank to an extent, and, and Gary Winograd, and he, you know he just got me into everything. So I, I really owe a debt to him. I'm sorry he couldn't be here. He was going to be here, but hopefully the the films will show in New York, and that's sort of the. That's sort of it. I don't know. Carol, can you add anything to that? No, I'm stunned. I can't say it. <laughs> we see so when, many people. That we, yeah, yeah, when's the last time you guys have seen these? 40 years ago. 40 at, at least, okay. you know, we made them 52 years ago. Wow. Um, and, uh, yeah, Catman is the one that, like, struck me first. It was, uh, you know, Kansas City Gork, the first one. It's, yeah. a, it's an underground narrative. I, I very much like it. The middle one, Come Dance With Me, it's very... Bruce Connor S. Bruce Connor of, the, yeah. of time. Absolutely, yeah. it was an homage to Bruce Connor. I remember we had it. There's the Gate Theater was uh, 
theater in in, uh, in New York, and we showed it. I think they showed it at the gate, and everybody got it was sort of a Bruce Connor homage. <laughs> Yeah. And you know that, that's really what yeah. what inspired it. And I like the first two a lot, but the Catman is what struck me the first time. Of just like uh, maybe it was just the performance, maybe it was the smashing together of the the narrative and the documentary of the performance piece, and just it it confounded me the first time. <laughs> and then the second time, I loved it, and then it, I've loved it ever since then. But it was definitely a uh, a, a mashing together of genres and styles that. Uh, took me aback at the time. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, and thank you, whoever came. Yeah. Uh, any quick questions? We'll we'll roll into the last forty-five minutes of movies. But if anybody has any, quickly. Yeah. You said you and your wife appeared in the cat, but uh, as the the couple. As a couple, yeah. Oh, me. <laughs> yeah, in our apartment. Everything you know, everything was shot. You know, I think I think part of the cat was shot in my grandmother's attic and with the, with the crib and and the. Again, the, the Kansas City Corpus shot in my father's medical office, and uh, you know we were just we were kids. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, okay. yeah. Might as well do a couple. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, all right. So, do you think that any of these later, like, affected you or related to your later writing in any way? Or ways of investigating the world, if not good, anything particular in him? It's a good question. No, I think it more affected my... I mean, I was a big Godard fan, still remain a big Godard fan. I think it was sort of... Dennis, in, in, you know, introduced us to, to Godard. No, I had a, you know, sort of... A, I was a novelist, a published novelist for uh, several years. You know, used to write stories for Playboy. Um, then I had a film career. Uh, Carney, The Sender, which was... Quentin Tarantino's favorite horror film of 1982. I don't think really it, it, it affected it in any way. Um, because I, I did direct one thing for, for HBO, um, for, the, for The Hitchhiker, but, um, and wrote and directed it, and was actually nominated for an Ace Award. So I always wanted to direct, um, but, and I regretted not doing it until I became a playwright in the last 10 years. I'd become a playwright and, and enjoying that as much as anything. So I don't, in a way, I don't think it really did impact much except uh, I don't you know I well, don't know. Were you directing? What, what was the division of labor between you and Dennis on these? That's a very good question. <laughs> um, I think the story sort of came from me, the, the inspiration, um, but I think the actual each shot, the inserts and everything. I think I, I didn't direct him to do the the inserts on on stuff. Okay. You know, on the turning. The, uh, I'm pretty sure that was all Dennis's. So it was a really a director cinematographer relationship, I think. Okay. But, um, you know. And then you edited them together mostly. We edited it there at NBC. Yeah. You know, we had a pro access to a projector and a synchronizer, and and it was a very crude kind of. I'm very, I'm actually impressed by the yeah. second one that we were able to do that. You know, do it to the to the music, and it was. And I hadn't seen that stuff with the with the you know going down the streets with the lights. Mm -hmm. I had never seen that before, and I've seen it you know a thousand times since. So that 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 was right. that, that was I like that. Yes. So Tom, I see one point of continuity, which is especially that last film, very psychoanalytic. Oh yeah. Oh of course. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. That that's that's a good point, because um, actually my cadaver partner is in that scene where in that party scene he's. Mike Fleischer is there, and I was always interested. I, that was my cover story when I went to medical school. I was pretended I was going to be a psychoanalyst, um, but then something got published and I quit. So, but no, that's, that's, that's true. That's true. Okay. So right. where were you by 1978 that they weren't able to find you? Oh yeah, I question. was uh, just we had just moved out to L.A. I had my first studio deal um, with um, United Artists. Uh, I was actually writing Carney with a movie, you know, Robbie Robertson, Gary Busey, and Jody Foster. That was um, I had written that already in New York, so it was pre-internet. There was no way to find anybody. Um, no, I mean, I had an address, you know. So. <laughs> it's interesting. I was cutting together the the show reel tonight, and uh, the Richard Greenberg movie has his address written on the head and the tail, but it's his old Chicago address, so they weren't able to. It, he probably had a burgeoning film career at the time too, so yeah. just unable to find him because they left. Well, know. not Richard Greenberg, the playwright. Different, different Richard Greenberg. Yeah. Well, wait, were you were these made in New York or Chicago? These movies? Yeah. New, uh, New York. Yeah. New York, South Orange, New Jersey. 
So do you recollect how the Chicago Cinema Group might have ended up with them to distribute? There's letters from you back and forth, uh, maybe even using uh, NBC Head. I, I sent you some pictures from the, my research. Uh, you might have even used NBC Stationery in writing well, the letters. Way back then? Wait, maybe. No, I, I need to go back and look at the texts that I sent you. But um, there I are left NBC in 68. I was a speech yeah. writer. I wrote speeches for... Oh, okay. For management, for the president. Oh, okay. very boring. It was very boring job. <laughs> well, when um, uh, when they took over the old collection from the Aardvark, I don't think this film was originally an Aardvark release. It wouldn't have been. Uh, so they just sent a lot of letters out to filmmakers asking them if they could um, show their uh, have their films in their collection. Probably "Come Dance with Me" was somewhat well-known at the time, so they're probably reaching out to you, but because of that... I don't know. Um, but there's a lot of... There's boxes of correspondence at the Chicago History Museum about them reaching out to artists to sort of bi uh, build their collection. Uh, Brackage said no, he didn't like the deal. Um, <laughs> so, so one more follow-up on Come Dance With Me. Since you said the USIA bought it, U.S. Information Agency would have films made and was basically the propaganda arm of the government. And then once a film was made by them, it couldn't be shown in the United States for 25 years. <laughs> and then it would get deposited at the National Archives where you could get it now. But th they picked this one up after you had already made it. So I'm curious if you know any relation to that. Was it allowed to be shown for the next 25 years in the U.S.? Do you have any idea why they might have thought of it appropriate as propaganda no, we were, material we, we were for shocked because, out of the U.S.? Because, I don't know really doesn't, I'm not sure, but showing Lyndon Johnson at the pumping the thing, we thought, well, that was, like, very transgressive at the time, <laughs> and, and what, why would they show? I, I think we got $1,000 from them, and as I say, we, uh, my college roommate advised us to, to form a company so we wouldn't get sued because we had no rights to the promotional footage. It was all, all that stuff that we had access to because we were in the department. And, uh, no, I don't know what, and we were never contacted by them. I have no idea. There are only some of the filmmakers that were Chicago-based represented by the co-op. Uh, most of them were uh, a lot of like the early David Cronenberg movies, uh, short films as part of the collection. But they, um, the only Chicago shot films are uh, Stephen Bezark's and uh, Richard Greenberg's in this in this show. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, David Cronenberg, I have to shout out to my wife who produced Dead Ringers. Oh, okay. Uh, Wow. And, and 35 other movies. Mm -hmm. That's a good shot. Okay, well, right. thank you. Yeah. Really, I'm thrilled yeah. to use it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, and enjoy the rest of the film.